And we are live for the first time in 2022. Yeah, it was a nice break, though. But can you believe that we're at season three? <laughs> it seems a little yeah, crazy. It's a little weird. That means that COVID's been around for a long time because that's how we started this. <laughs> right. So we we're just talking about this. This show started during COVID because we were born. So, yes. Mm -hmm. And it became a thing. So they've stuck right. to it. Oh, so uh, it's uh, so uh, one of one of the few good things I guess that came out of COVID was the birth of the CCX2 show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and great guests like uh, below me, Kelly McCann. We're gonna we're gonna get all into uh, who you are and and what you're about. But welcome, thank you so much for joining us. We're really looking forward to the show tonight. Thanks, guys. And. Uh, Luke's here. Sal, Sal's welcome back, back Sal. <laughs> I'm back. Very good. Yeah, very good. Uh, Sal is reporting in from a now free state of Virginia again. Nice. Actually, Kelly is a fellow Virginian, so 100%, we're uh, we're living in a free state again, at least for the time being. And uh, we've for now. we've had we've had such uh, political discussions on past shows uh, last year and the year before, as you would imagine, Kelly, with uh, the whole political turn of events, uh, specifically pertaining to gun control. So a lot of our listeners was, are well familiar with with Sal, that. Whole Sal was heated. I remember those uh, those uh -huh. discussions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So so Kelly McCann is actually a fellow Virginian, um, and I, I think Kelly, I learned that you were actually not far away from me probably five or six years ago. I mm -hmm. finally got off my ass to come train with you this past year, of course, in December. I finally made it down to do that. But um, Kelly McCann, those of you in the audience who are martial arts enthusiasts going way back, the man probably needs no introduction. I remember, you know, in, in my uh, early adulthood, seeing you on black belt magazine and then picking up the paladin press videos and the, the whole deal. So, um, Kelly does a lot of stuff. He's got a military background. He's a serious shooter, uh, firearms instructor, and probably for a lot of people, they're probably primarily familiar with you as the combatives guy, I, I would think. Um, so he does a lot great way to kick off the season this year with with such a guest and um i'm proud to say that i actually finally did train and trained in combatives uh with with kelly in in december so i was looking kind of beat up with our final uh, <laughs> our broadcast uh, at the end of last <laughs> year you, yeah it was right I on the I, I wish we got ready i could have put a screenshot up from from that show and show you show your face <laughs> yeah 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 so so i i you know and for years i had wanted though to specifically do a combatives course with you kelly and i finally got to do it and it was freaking awesome uh there's some reviews out online including on my blog about it for those of you interested so naturally i i cannot suggest highly enough to all of you if, if you can make it to virginia train with kelly in combatives or any of the stuff he teaches absolutely do that so with that kelly tell our folks a little bit about yourself your your background is extensive so it can be you know the the elevator pitch and we'll get started. yeah uh background i mean started boxing when i was 12 years old uh went to college got a criminal justice degree joined the marine corps had a commission as an infantry officer. Uh, then I got involved in special operations uh, after being an infantry officer and a raid company commander, um, <clears throat> platoon commander, then raid company commander. And then um, was assigned to an external uh, purple unit, which is comprised of all the military services. It's a tier one uh, force and spent the balance of my uh, time with them. And then after getting out of the military, um, started a civilian company uh, that serviced only special mission units and lettered agencies and um, 
government contracts, things like that, uh, which is called the crucible and still retained that client, uh, the, uh, the unit as a client. And then, uh, right after Obama, um, started the rollback, obviously it affected what we were doing with our overhead there at crucible because it was a huge overhead, right? Um, a lot of material, a lot of land, a lot of vehicles, a lot of weapons, et cetera. So downsized, uh, with my partner, Michelle Washington <clears throat> started a new company called Combatus brand, which is civilian facing. Um, and the idea behind Combatus brand was to get away from training specialized military people and intelligence agencies and things like that, and make these skills accessible to just regular people. Because, you know, what you learn is high speed really is truly is being able to do the fundamentals, no matter what, whether you're hurt or whether it's cold or it's dark or you're scared or whatever, if you're high speed, if you get the job done in a very, uh, simple way and you just can't be rattled. So what we thought was it'd be cool to take civilians and uh, let them access those skill sets, you know, whether it was shooting or whether it was unarmed stuff or apprehension avoidance. We do a restraint release course for civilians that teaches them how to get out of different restraints and things like that. Um, and so that's uh, where we are. We've got a couple of really large um, corporate clients, like a couple of the largest companies in the United States that bring us in to do a streetwise seminar, which you got, Sal, when you came down, part of it, uh, which is kind of the whole situational awareness, um, pre-incident indicators, you know, how to see something developing so that you can extricate yourself before it manifests into a whole attack. And uh, that's kind of what we do. Uh, we still have a couple of government uh, contracts as combatives brand. We've got a couple of high net worth individual protection details that we train. Um, we still do things for some law enforcement organizations that uh, contact us with special needs. And uh, I'm on that glide scope, uh, glide slope to dying. So I, as I get older, I'm getting I'm, it, the pace is picking up. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And you also own or operate own, own a gym as well, right? Uh, yeah. Renegade Combat Sports. Thanks, Luke. Um, yeah. We uh, are really successful MMA Muay Thai uh, gym in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia currently house the uh, amateur heavyweight uh, champion, uh, currently the pro heavyweight champion and the bantamweight title holder as well. So yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. <laughs> no problem. It's CTE, man. That's the price I pay. You know? <laughs> right. cool. Yeah. And, and, and with, with that said, um, some of those champion guys actually uh, assist and um, instruct with, with Kelly. So, I'm proud to say that I've actually been punched and need by a, a pro MMA fighter. So that's one of the benefits of training with Kelly is you'll be able to tell your friends that. Um, it's about and, time and, you know, the club. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, Brandon we, hasn't, but <laughs> we're, we're gonna send uh, we're gonna send Brandon to to Kelly this year. It's gonna that happen. sounded like a gauntlet, Brandon. He threw yeah, it on yeah. the gauntlet. Yeah, 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 for sure. But uh, speaking of which, Kelly, for folks in our audience interested in training with you, are you doing any more of the road show or are those days over? Are you doing everything out of your home base now? Class offerings. That's a great question. I mean, like we, we were going to do the 2020 hindsight tour, right? Because 2020 was perfect. It worked <laughs> with the whole theme, you know, 2020 vision, 2020 hindsight. But COVID just totally screwed that up, right? I mean, mm. like COVID hit. And uh, so we still uh, do go on the road. We've got a couple of events going on the road uh, this coming year. Um, and if we're, we have people that are interested in hosting, they can contact us and, uh, they can host either shooting courses or, uh, you know, unarmed combat courses, knife or stick, whatever they ground, whatever they want. Cool. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we were supposed to stop doing that in 2020, but it didn't work out that way. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah, our, common, our audience yeah. remembers that you had a black eye. Yeah, class. exactly. Yeah. Cause yeah, that, was, that was following, following that class. So. I took um, the basic combatives class that um, Kelly offers, and I see you've got it on your schedule a couple times for this year. Mm -hmm. I cannot recommend it highly enough. It's intense. Nobody gets killed, right? There might be uh, a few black guys and that kind of thing. So it's intense training, but you know, nobody nobody gets seriously hurt. And I, I cannot recommend it highly enough. It, it was really great. I've not done a lot of that stuff uh, throughout my lifetime. I haven't been in a, a, a fist fight since high school. You know, I got into a couple good ones in high school, but, and that's how it is for most of us, right? 
So uh, my main focus has always been been shooting. I've done a few um, things like some ground fighting seminars and a few things like that since in that entire adult life. So obviously it's not something that I do a lot of. So I think the great thing about uh, a class like this, it really gives you the ability to get a taste of it in a relatively safe environment, mm-hmm. right? You can really get an idea of not only learn the techniques that are just you know, brutal and to the point and effective, but you, you get to duke it out with people and, and, and pressure test it a bit. So it was really, really great stuff. And I highly recommend it. That was the basic combatives class. And Kelly, based on what you told me, that's kind of a great foundation then for anybody who would go on to do any of your other classes as well. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, so what we've experienced is like probably in the last, when I left crucible, you know, um, training just the military units and things like that. You know I mean? We, we always demand that they fight. You can't learn to fight without actually fighting, you know, like you can't learn to drive without actually driving a car. Um, so if all the training consists of is hitting pads and making mean faces and pushing each other around, you, you really haven't done anything. You know I mean? You've got to get into a consequential situation. So like with basic combatives, you remember, so we only, we keep it to about like 60 to 90 seconds each iteration and there's a lot of iterations but it's 60 to 90 seconds but you know there's a consequence like you can get a black eye you can you know <clears throat> get a puffy ear you can yeah. you know get knocked down or you, i suppose you get knocked out uh but at the end of the day the learning curve from that consequence is is just enormous right i mean mm-hmm. because when you experience it that way you can smell bullshit Right. In other words, you know, you can have some guy that's a master blaster and is prancing around a dojo or something like that. And he's telling you to do things. And you might say, I'm not sure I believe that. Well, when you go through like our basic combatives course, you become the arbiter of your own understanding. In other words, you know, you you can say that's nonsense. That would right. never actually happen because you've actually had to fight with someone who is intent on fighting you. Mm-hmm. Um, and. I'm, I'm like my own worst salesman, right? Because I'm telling people who are already kind of like thinking, oh, should I do this? Like, okay, this is what we do. But as Sal pointed out, we do it as safely as possible. Um, there's a lot of camaraderie. There's no meat eaters in there that are just in there to trounce people, right? right. I mean, everyone's a very mutually helping, uh, supportive group. Um, so if, if ever you wanted to, to learn actual combatives, like how do I actually protect myself? Or, or how do I learn if I can? And if I can't, then how do I get hyper situationally aware so that I can avoid it? You know, because that's not a bad thing either. I mean, some people, you know, be, because of whatever reason, they just can't fight. Well, when you find that out, you have two ways to go. You can either put the time and attention to it, which most people won't. Or you can say, you know what? I don't want any part of that. And I have to be like super situationally aware. And I have to be super avoidant. Because mm-hmm. if it goes to that, I'm sunk. Right. So, yeah. And that combatus class is just hands-on stuff. There was no, is there shooting in that or, there, or, there's, or? there's no shooting in that okay. one, Luke. Uh, however, in some groups, when we have a really shooter, um, in, intense group where there's a lot of shooters, what I'll do is I'll have guys put blue guns on mm-hmm. and they have to access their weapon. Right. So in other okay. words, in, in the moment, you know, like clear the, clear the situation, make space, then be able to draw. Right. Yeah. If it's a ground situation, how to protect the weapon so it can't be grabbed mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then get the person. <clears throat> I think we did that with your group cell, right? Where we we did the uh, overhook and then kind of hipped out and then got to the weapon without him being able to touch it. Yes, yes. Yeah. And there was actually a very uh, interesting, uh, like a whole afternoon was on ground stuff. Yep. And and. Paul- Part of that was exactly that being able to access weapons on the ground. So, so again, all realistic, you know, stuff that certainly takes from boxing, Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu, and Kelly mm-hmm. explains all of that, you know, but, but it's all kind of synthesized down to this is brutally effective stuff that, that <laughs> works in a fight, you know? And uh, it, so it, it's, it's really, I mean, from what I've seen, it's, it's one of the few training curriculums where you can go to, to get the distilled street, credible stuff you know there's there's just not much of it i when i think in terms of uh again i i think 
doing wrestling and Brazilian jiu-jitsu and all of that stuff is is great. But I think a program like Kelly's it synthesizes it down and says, this is the brutally effective stuff taking into account all of the realities of the street, right? Weapons that, that are always in play, um, you know, things like the knockout game and all this stuff, you know, for mm -hmm. example, something like, uh, and I'll get you to speak on this, Kelly, something like jujitsu, which is a phenomenal foundation, you know, for people to, to learn and fight with. But um, I've never done much of it myself, but Luke, you could speak to this from what I've been told by a lot of jujitsu guys. They're like, yeah, you know, we spent the whole first six months in the jujitsu gym rolling around on the ground, but nobody even talked about how we got to the ground in the first place. You know, what, what does that look like? So I, I think a program, even if you're into jujitsu or Krav Maga or whatever the things that you're doing, I, I think uh, a course like the ones Kelly teaches are a real wake up call for people, you know, a, a reality check. Right. Yeah. I can only speak for the gym I go to, but um, with Greg being one of the instructors that has done all this stuff, plus jujitsu, they'll talk about certain techniques and like, all right, here's stuff that's more for competition, but on the street, that's not going to work. Do this. So they do do a good bit of differentiating what's going to work that's in competition. He, that's versus what's going to actually teaching. work when you're right. 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 So, that's, uh, so Greg, so teaching. a good example of that, Luke, is like, a lot of techniques when you're doing uh, BJJ, you know, I mean, obviously we're an MMA gym uh, at Renegade, so mm -hmm. we're very useful doing that all the time. Um, what you can get away with on a mat in changing position and all that stuff, you can't get away on asphalt because it's like you're on sandpaper. Right. Right. So like you even even getting quarter hip sometimes can be really hard when you've got top pressure, but you're being pushed onto asphalt right. or concrete because you can't slide. You can't slip. Right. Right. So, so that's, that's a good observation and absolutely true. Right. Yeah. And, and it's that, it's that, uh, sorry, I was just going to say it's that realism, right. That what you do on a map might be different than, and Kelly puts all this in context throughout the course, you know, this is different if you're shoved up against a dumpster, you know, on broken glass <laughs> in a back alley. Right. So that, that context is there throughout the whole class. So it's, it's beneficial for anybody. So right. go ahead, Luke. Uh, we just have to, Take a brief pause for our sponsor today, U.S. Law Shield. They're still a sponsor of the show. So, Brandon, if you want to run that. Self-defense is an instinct. 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 If you're ever forced to make a life or death decision to protect yourself or your loved ones, you wouldn't hesitate. Would you? Would you? Would you? Don't let what could happen after become a courtroom nightmare. Get peace of mind for $10.95 a month. Get the best self-defense and concealed carry protection from U.S. Law Shield today. This is one of those products. We talk about it a lot, but we have it. Um, it's, you know, it would be a big sigh of relief to know that we have it if we're ever in a bad situation. Um, and you can get two months uh, two months added to an annual membership, but you have to use our link. It's coming up here real quick on the bottom. Uh, it's uslawshieldcomeon.com. <laughs> this is the link that I'm about to put. Slash yeah. PCX2. <laughs> Brandon is so prepared. I wanted to make sure that it was good. Link is in the um, chat. Perfect. Um, real quick, too. Um, I'm going to go to a question somebody had. Where is that? They were asking, what's what's the class cost and what do you need to bring? Kelly, you said it's about three to $350. Is that a one-day class, two-day, weekend? No, two days. Two days. And all you need is a mouth guard, cup, and groin protection. Or yeah, and sometimes if we're running it at our facility, um, I think we sell it at 200 and then we do like non-sale price at 250 So okay. if, it's, if we're traveling, you know, we've got to bear our travel costs and all that stuff. But if it's at our gym and uh, they get to it post, it's usually like two fifty. Gotcha. Uh, so it's a steal for any kind of training. And and again, since it's you know at your premises, I presume you don't have all that overhead overhead cost, so you're able to offer it at such reasonable prices. But you're talking about you know two solid days of of training, and and you you have a few one day classes as well too, Kelly. Right? You have some topic specific stuff that you offer. Yeah, we do. Uh, one that we, we run is called Self Defenseless. And what that course is, it's kind of shrouded in mystery, so I don't want to talk about it a whole lot. But 
it puts people right off go, like right when you get there, like we meet you, do the waivers and all that stuff. And then we put you into some physical and uh, combative uh, and combat sports situations that will make you very uncomfortable, like very uncomfortable. Um, and it's it's it, it, it done intentionally, right? Because everyone has sometimes not uh, quite true ideas of what they can and can't do. So we bring them in and then we like put them in these situations and then we break for lunch. And then when we come back, we say, okay, now that we know, know ourselves, mm -hmm. right. And what we really are capable of, let's fix those holes. Let's fix those things. And then we spend the rest of that one day going back and taking those really awkward and uncomfortable situations and then grind into people. Okay. Here's how, here's how you manage that. Here's how you get out of that situation or here, here's how you deal with that situation. We've had really good success uh, with that course. A um, little bit intimidating, but it's meant to be. I mean, right. It, it sh it's shrouded in mystery because if you know everything, then you're not, you don't have any anxiety. I want you to have anxiety. Right. Uh, I want you to be anxious coming to it. And then I, that tells me something about the person that signs up for it right away. Right. right. For all the people that don't sign up for it, you're like, okay, well you can't even handle the anxiety of knowing what this is. So if you can, and you say like, that intrigues me, that tells me right there, you, you have a good foundation of wanting to know, of want, of subjecting yourself to that situation so that you can fix yourself. Right. Yeah. So it's almost self-vetting in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we do that. That's a one day course. We do one day knife clinics. We do one day uh, stick uh, fighting clinics that are centered on collapsible baton use and bludgeons, saps, um, you know, pocket sticks, yawaras, capos, kubaton, stuff like that. Cool. Um, and then we do a one day uh, streetwise seminar, which is all academic. It's all multimedia. It all has to do with personal security, how to do security at your house, physical security, how to do security when you're traveling and all that stuff. And I think that's about all the one days that we do. Okay. And yeah. the comment that was up, Robert, the, uh, yeah. the, yeah, the feeling is mutual. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was another hey, Robert in the class. Yes. Yeah. Uh, fellow <laughs> classmate. Uh, speaking of which there's a lot of good AARs after action reports about Kelly's stuff. For those of you interested in getting more firsthand experiences and reviews on that at a great blog called civilian gunfighter. Okay. And because of the name, it doesn't just pop up in Google. You might actually have to go. I think it's civiliangunfighter.com or civiliangunfighter.wordpress.com. They've been around for quite a few years now. And those guys who do that blog are perpetual students of the craft. They have after action reports on several mm -hmm. of Kelly's um, courses, but they, they've reviewed a ton of courses. In fact, I've looked at their stuff for years, you know, when I when I want to go train with any particular guy, because chances yeah. are they've trained with that guy already and they they do right. real detailed reviews. That's... So absolutely awesome uh, resource for any of you interested. And I I think he's done about six courses with you, Kelly, and he's 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 reviewed all of them. So he's wow. got great reviews up on it. So um, with that said, uh, Kelly, could you explain to people? Because in the course, you you know, you did a great job of explaining this. The term combatives is thrown around so much, right? Luke, Brandon, you guys hear that all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's hard to determine what does that mean. Some of us, you know, if, if you're a history buff like me, kind of think back to, you know, what came out of World War II, where I think mm -hmm. that term became a thing. But give us an idea of what it is and, and what it's turned into. And, and obviously a lot of the, the derp that has come into it you know, uh, but kind of clarify what it is and, and what it should be. Okay. <clears throat> Great question, Sal. Um, so uh, in my book, you can go online to Amazon and find this book. It's called Combatives for Street Survival. It's a black belt book I did with black belt years ago. I defined combatives as kind of a um, an intentionally finite set of skills that are principle based. So in other words, it's you're, you're focusing on principles, not actual like techniques, right? And the idea is that techniques can all fail. Principles become principles because they don't fail. They stand the test of time and 
no matter what, if you apply the principles, if, the, if they're validated as principles, then you're not wrong, right? Things like, you know, stay to the outside of the elbow, right? Uh, perpendicularity, you know, full body weight striking, uh, go armed is another principle of ours. Um, if you apply those principles in a dynamic situation, you're never wrong. But the combatives was initially adopted back all the way to like World War I. Uh, it was mostly boxing. Um, World War II, it became influenced by some of the jujitsu and some of the Escrima and our niece from the Filipinos that we were working with in, in, uh, in World War II. Um, and there was a plethora of instructors, really known guys, O'Neill, Biddle, um, Delisco, guys, uh, Wesley Brown, that, that, that were combat sports guys. And then they applied it to combatives or, or they created combatives. But combatives was just a way... It was like it was like fighting 101, right? It was the shortest distance between A and B. It was like, okay, we're taking in hundreds of thousands of soldiers and hundreds of thousands of Marines. What can we do with them in like three weeks, doing three hours a day, every other day for three weeks? What can mm -hmm. we do that's semi-meaningful, but most importantly, what can we do to make them fight, to get them okay with banging each other up? Because what they learned back then was still true today, but true then too. Most people had never even been punched in the face, like literally punched in the face with intent, like somebody who meant to hurt you. So they had to do something to, to not only put, you know, decent skills on guys' brains, but also to get them to fight. So combatives was never meant as a panacea, right? It was never meant as like a, you know, my my combatives is going to trump your MMA experience. No, it's not. Not in a million years. It ain't happening, right? <laughs> and guys that say that stuff are always the guys that say, well, I'll gouge your eyes. Okay, so what that means is I'm a really accomplished MMA fighter, and now I'm going to be a really accomplished MMA fighter that also gouges your eyes, and I'm going to be better at it, right? So it's, it's just a ridiculous argument. Um, people that, you know, say that, well, I'll just grab your groin. Well, okay, I'll grab your groin. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just like <laughs> silly arguments. It's it's yeah. and all of that is always said by people who don't train with consequences. They they're always training with an inanimate meat puppet that that falls down when they're supposed to, or crumples at the first hammer fist, or something like that. Not with guys that actually take hits and fight back. That's the difference, right? So that's why when we teach it, like we, you came through our course, you learn that, yeah, the other guy gets a turn too at the same time you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's a game changer, yeah. right? That is a real game changer. Most of the combatives today that are out there are all preemptive. Okay. So in other words, um, you're standing there, you start to, to feel awkward. Your movement is restricted. Um, and you're illegally arrested. There is an assault, but not a battery yet. Um, and you're supposed to just cook off on a guy. And that's what they train. They train like, okay, now I just cook off and then you fall down at the appropriate time. They never train like you cook off and then you get punched right in the nose or you get punched right in the face or you get kicked in the balls. They never mm -hmm. do that. Right. It's mm -hmm. always like I go preemptive and then I win. And that's just phony. Yeah. Right. Right. It's yeah. just, it's fakery. Um, uh, I've seen some of the most ridiculous shit you have ever seen in your life with guys who have no ground background talking about counter grappling. I mean, it's mm -hmm. laughable. It is absolutely laughable. Luke, you roll. So think about this. You've got high mount on me, right? Mm -hmm. They'll teach these kind of guys will teach. I'm supposed to hammer fist your groin. <laughs> so you're. You're in high mount on me. Your knees are in my armpit. And with uh -huh. no range of motion, I'm supposed to hammer fist your groin and then you fall off. What am I doing with my hands at that point? Right. I'm just yeah. going to Well, if you're, if you're rolling like you, you'd be snatching my arm to put me. Right. right so I'm arm. just going to stand there high mount like this so you can hit my nuts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you're actually you sitting on your testicles, right? So I'm actually not right, punching right. your nuts. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, And that's the kind of shit that's out there. And, and it's mm -hmm. because those guys – don't actually do ground. They don't actually do MMA. They don't do Muay Thai. They don't do boxing. So they, 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 they hang on to that. Well, I'm going to go preemptive and then I'm going to do that. And then that goes further sell to something you alluded to earlier when we were talking, some of these guys are teaching like, okay, I'm nervous. 
you're in my face. Maybe you're a little bit bigger than me. So now I'm going to snatch my knife and I'm actually going to abanico your eye with my knife. Do you, so gonna... People got to realize how incredibly illegal that is. Yeah. I mean, like that's, that's like murder, right? Like you just. <laughs> if you so just you're in my face, face I'm just yeah. going to stab yeah. you in the eye. Yeah. Because you made me nervous. I, I slam my knife into your eye socket. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, listen, mm -hmm. the, the law of self-defense does not protect you from, from getting your ass kicked in a mutual combatant situation. Mm -hmm. If it's a mutual combatant situation, there will be a loser. The law doesn't prevent you from losing. It prevents you from the egregious use, right, or the illegal use of force. But if it's a mutual combatant situation, uh, yeah, that's on you, you know. Um, there's just so much – there's so much – ridiculous nonsense and when i started doing this in the 90s with paladin and all that stuff you know it was a real uh group of like guys that kind of had it right and they were like thinking about it correctly and everything and and they used to eschew the martial arts the traditional martial arts for all the things that we don't like about traditional martial arts right and guess what combatives has become the traditional martial arts mm. there are there's rank now some guys give rank right uh, I mean, here in the United States, people give rank with, with Muay Thai. There's no rank in Muay Thai. The only thing that you get in Muay Thai is seniority by how many fights you have. It's mm. an American construct where you're given rank, right? There's no rank in Muay Thai. There's no rank in boxing, right? So now you're telling me I got a rank in combatives? It's all, it's all bullshit, man. And I'm, and I'm old in, in the, you know, I'm long in the tooth. I'm 63 and I'm just, I'm saying a lot of this things now because I just don't give a shit. I mean, people need to hear it. They need to know it. Right. Well, uh, one thing I want to touch on, and and you started getting into it, Kelly, um, to let our audience know that in all the classes he teaches, and certainly in the class that I was in, Kelly goes into detail about the appropriate use of force, which again is unusual for a lot of guys with a with a military background, because I've trained with a lot of those guys. And it's all, you know, blood and gut stuff that is not appropriate at all for the, the civilian in the United States. You know, so Kelly is very clear about that, putting it in context for the civilian, like he was talking about preemptive so, striking. You know, you're wading into a real cesspool of what can happen legally when you get into hitting anybody preemptively under most circumstances. Yeah, a hundred percent. Now, you can um, a couple of years ago, we did a a CLET course, which is a course for a bunch of lawyers and judges. And we brought them in and we put them in uncomfortable situations with our fighters to make them feel uh, defenseless so they could better prosecute, defend and judge self-defense hmm. courses. Right. And it was a certified CLET course and everything. And on that day, there was a federal judge. It was a two day course. And I asked him specifically, I mean, this guy hears like capital cases and has sent people to uh, jail for life as well as the death, uh, uh, you know, assigned the death penalty. And I asked him about that. I said, what about this preemption thing? And he said, well, th there is situations where you can preempt. OK. And he said, you know, you've got to be able to articulate all the things I'm sure the viewers know. Right. Um, dilated pupils, veins sticking out in your forehead, clenched fists, clenched jaw, tight lips dry mouth, um, yelling, you know, all of those things that, that made you feel that your life was at risk or that mm -hmm. you felt that you were at risk. But he went on to say that decision to do that might have been correct. However, it's going to be reviewed by largely a very liberal judiciary. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of yeah. judges across the nation, I would venture to say most, who will always say you can never hit anyone first. You can never, because that would be seen as es escalation, right? right? So, I mean, if you feel really nervous, guy's bigger than you, and you say, I have no choice, and you pop this guy, he falls down, hits his head. Now he's a paraplegic because he broke his neck on a curb. Um, that judge might say, well, you're the one that escalated it. And obviously, if it's a civil litigation case, and that guy that was the predator is brought into court, and a lawyer asks him, were you actually going to hit my client? What's he going to say? Of course I wasn't. I was mad. Right. I, wasn't, I wasn't going to hit him. He's, that's bullshit. Of course he was. So it's a very, very, very slippery slope, right? And and for that reason, how many times did you hear me say, Sal, for all of these reasons, it supports what? Avoidance. 
Mm -hmm. right? Not being, not getting into it. Cause once the use of force yeah. starts, it's like uh, in the Marine Corps, we had uh, FM one war fighting. And we always talked about the ungovernable elements of risk and chance. Once force is being used, there's risk and chance. They favor neither combatant and they cannot be controlled. They simply exist on the battlefield. Well, you know, that's a real gamble. You know, and, and just because you're highly skilled and train all the time does not mean that a 14 year old with a number 10 Phillips screwdriver can't kill you. Right. Right. I mean, now the same thing is true. You talk about my military background. The same thing is true in the land uh, law of land warfare. So it would be irresponsible when you're training even elite military units to not talk about rules of engagement. Uh, and things like that, because some of the things that are being taught right now to civilians, okay, in the, in the marketplace, wouldn't be illegal on a battlefield. I mean, they wouldn't be legal on a battlefield. Like you literally could not do them. It would be seen as mutilation, or it would be seen as, uh, you know, over over and beyond the use of force necessary. Mm -hmm. Yet they're being taught by some guy who's nervous about going to Boston. Come on, man. <laughs> Right. And Kelly, see, but that—that's. I'm sorry, Brandon. Go ahead. I, I just. I. I wanted to add. It, it's been. There have been like a hundred opportunities to ask this question, but I'm just curious to what your what your answer, what your words would be, because most of the people that watch our show, they carry a gun almost every day. Some of them carry every day, and, you know, so for your for your average. Uh, armed citizen who's carrying a gun around mm -hmm. for the courses that that you provide um, how how beneficial or or how important or how necessary do you think it is for someone who carries a gun every day uh, to take and seek out a uh, you know one of your courses or a course like that that's a, a great question Brandon and the reason is is because the, the, the likelihood of you having to actually draw your weapon and employ it is is minuscule mm -hmm. compared to the number of times you're going to have somebody jump in your face, grab your door handle, block your way, speak in a cross uh, way to you. Uh, minuscule. Right now, another reason for it. So, number one, the overwhelming majority of situations are going to be you using your brain, your mouth, your avoidance capability then your hands, then maybe a bridge weapon, right? Like a can of OC or, you know, an aspiton or something like that, a bludgeon of some kind or something like that, and then yep. lethal force. But importantly, let's say that you and I got into a scramble, right? And I could be in the wrong or you could be in the wrong. It doesn't really matter. But you're carrying a weapon. So I enter, it's concealed, and I we get into this scramble. So we're tussling, and you hit me, I hit you, we're hitting each other. And then my hand brushes your weapon. So yep. now I suddenly realize you have a gun. What normally happens in that situation is I fast forward, whether it was true or not, to he's going to shoot me. So what mm -hmm. do I do? I try to take your weapon. Yeah. Okay? So now you're in the situation where you have to be able not to use your weapon, not even to clear the weapon, just to retain your weapon. Retain it, protect it. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, and maybe not use it, but just like keep me from getting it. Right. Because if my thought process was that you were going to snatch that gun and shoot me, then there's a possibility that I'm going to snatch your gun and shoot you with it. Right. Right. So I, I honestly, my partner, Michelle, I think you heard her say this, um, Sal, she really has a hard time with the, the gun community and the knife community because they default to, mm -hmm. well, I don't need that because I have this. Right. And they don't look at it like, yeah, but that's a really small subsection of the kind of problems you're going to have. So in order to be holistic, right, it's just like you have to have stand up and you have to be good on the ground. Well, you have to be good with weapons and you have to be good with your hands. If you're mm -hmm. serious about this stuff, right? And I don't mean you have to be, you know, like Olympic level or anything like that, but you, you, you have to have some hand skills, man. And right. you have to have some ground skills and, and, like and we understanding earlier, what you're capable of. Right. A hundred percent. 
hundred percent. So thank you for that question. That was a really good one. I, I personally would, would suggest that if you carry a concealed weapon, you need the kind of training that we provide, not only unarmed, but also, you know, I think we do a pretty good job with, with uh, teaching pistol as well and, and other firearms. Yeah. Cause I, I think that, I think that there are a lot of people that carry and, and they think about those scenarios like, okay, what if I, you know, get into someone or someone comes up from behind me and just, you know, tackles me, how am I going to retain my gun? Oh, I'll, I'm a big guy, you know, I'm a strong guy. I'll, I'll be able to handle it. Um, but they've never, they've never been in that situation before, you know, whether in real life or, uh, you know, something like this that they would get in your class and they don't know a, how they'd react and b what they actually would be capable of doing, you know, a hundred percent to include, and I don't is fitness, right? So like a fitness, lot of guys, yeah. I see a lot of guys carrying a lot of extra weight. And I'm going to tell you, even for if we have a three round, five minute round fight, right? Mm -hmm. So 15 minutes of fighting, we actually make those fighters do six five minute rounds in training so that they know they, they go double so that they mm -hmm. know when they get in there with fight anxiety and consequence that they've got the gas tank. Mm -hmm. You can take an average guy who's a little bit overweight, right? And he comes to one of our courses, ask Sal. And mm -hmm. then no kidding, one of those 60 second or 90 second events Done. they're smoked Done. oh yeah. yeah absolutely smoked yeah in, in in 60 seconds right so so again that's an important thing to learn right yeah and you know speaking of that uh in the class you had us do like it was only like 30 second rounds and we go mm -hmm. round robin uh, man i'll tell you i was gassed by the end of it right were and, you breathing uh, right or were you holding your breath half the time like no not really but i mean i don't like, i don't do that kind of of training you know and one thing right. that i can tell you that that i have heard many many times training with a lot of different guys it's kind of uh when you get into the gun guys who at least will do some training with the gun grappling stuff, one thing that we've kind of concluded that the average guy literally only has 30 seconds of fight in them. Oh, right. You know, and like it, w when I've done some hardcore training, like with sim guns and you're fighting over the gun, like you literally guys go to the ground and unless this guy is maybe a serious jujitsu guy or a guy who's used to that, Seriously, Luke, there's 30 seconds of fight in the guy uh -huh. until he's gassed. And certainly I experienced that, Kelly, in your class, man. By the time we finished, it was more than 30 seconds. It was mm -hmm. 30 seconds on each guy. But, man, I was gassed by the end of it. Mm -hmm. Part of that is the adrenalization, right? So yeah. think about mm -hmm. this, guys. When you are in a, a consequential event, right, whether it's someone throwing their fist at your head or a gun comes out or whatever, uh, if you've ever done high-intensity interval training, you know, um, your intent is to quadruple your heart rate. Right. So you do it with box jumps, you do it with burpees, you do it with any number of things. And it takes you a little bit of time to get there. Right. So my resting heart rate, because I have brachycardia, I haven't been a special ops guy. My heart is like super conditioned is 50. That means that if I do like CrossFit or I do some kind of combat conditioning, it might take me a minute and a half, two minutes to get my heart rate up to 200. When you recognize the consequence of an event, a gunshot goes by your head, someone brandishes a gun in front of you, someone takes a poke at your face or hits you, your heart immediately quadruples. Your heart rate immediately quadruples. Immediately, like boom. So now think about that and trying to shoot, trying to draw a weapon, trying to defend yourself, right? You have to experience those things. You have to, it's it's very, very experiential. And you, you went through it, Sal. You know that the more that you do it, the more you acclimate to it, and then you're better at it, right? You're you don't you don't have that highly adrenaline thing because it's familiar, it's recent and frequent, and you perform better. But if 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 guys like typically you hear big talking guys will go like, yeah, well, I'll just deal with that when it happens. No, you fucking won't. Mm -hmm. You you won't deal with that at all. You know, I mean, you're you're gonna fold up. You're you're gonna be your heart's gonna be racing. And the reason you say that is because you've never experienced it. Mm -hmm. um, Great, great question. This is a great discussion. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if, if I could get you to go a little bit further in that, Kelly, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, again, with, with the shooting, the first time I did a serious force-on-force -force class years ago, 
And this was by an outfit that was really professional. It, uh, all the role actors were the staff mm -hmm. and they were good. They had stuff like uh, a woman being on her knees about to be executed, screaming like it was so intense. Some of the students were crying after the scenarios. It was just, uh, you know, magnificently wow. done. Um, I went through every scenario. I never got shot once. And I just burned guys to the ground every time. And uh, the instructors said to me, you've obviously done this before. The truth was it was the first force on force I ever did. And I kept saying, this is my first time. But you know the ingredient? I was a competitive shooter. Mm -hmm. I was a competitive shooter. And I'd go into those scenarios. And it was the first time I had done force on force training. But I could tell my heart rate would elevate a little, but I wasn't out of control, you know, and I was able to see things and I was able to think with a gun in my hand because I had done a lot of IDPA shooting. So mm -hmm. the people say, you know, competitive shooting is ridiculous. No, it's not because you learn to operate with a gun in your hand under pressure. And when we talk about hand to hand stuff, if you're doing that in any capacity, if you're doing jujitsu, or wrestling or boxing. No, it's not a fight on the street, but you're getting conditioned to doing stuff under pressure, right? And under stress. So could, could you go into that, Kelly? Like a guy who who does this kind of training actually against live people, I realize there's no guns and knives involved and you're not rolling around on the asphalt, but how much, like how much in a better circumstance does that put the practitioner compared to a guy who's never been there in any capacity? Great question again. Um, so like when you, when you think there's a lot of combatives in quotes, combatives guys, and I mean like sarcastic air quotes, combatives guys um, will impugn combat sports, right? They laugh at there's, that's not like it's on the street. You know, there's a referee, there's a this, there's a that. I get all that, right? Being, I, look, I'm a combative guy, right? I mean, I did, got all the videos. I mean, I'm a, a military guy. I'm, I'm that guy. However, I'm also an MMA guy, a Muay Thai guy, and a boxing guy. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because when you actually fight and do hard sparring and things like that, what those combative guys don't understand because they've never done it is that the opponents – are actually trying to hit each other in the head as hard as they can. There isn't a safe mode, okay? <laughs> like, you, know, there's not a, like, okay, not let's go 50%. You're literally trying to knock a guy out. You're trying to open a cut that's bad enough that blood's dripping in his eyes he can't see. I'm trying to elbow you in the face to the point where I gash your cheek and, and I get a doctor stoppage. If I roll with Luke, he's actually trying to choke me unconscious. Mm -hmm. He's actually trying to make me go to sleep. Okay. So, so what all, all these combatives guys don't understand, they don't understand that because they don't do it. Right. And so like they talk big shit and then I can't tell you the number of times on our Facebook page and all of that stuff where we've been, I am, then I've actually put the gym address I said, look, if you feel like that, here's our address, please mm -hmm. come to our next class and, uh, and, and join in. They never show up. No one ever shows up, right? Mm -hmm. As much big talking shit that's out there. The same thing is true for competitive shooting uh, with one caveat. And the caveat is some of the competitions uh, that you've seen, I've seen, everyone here on the – Brandon has seen, they can get to be ridiculous mm -hmm. and they yeah. can be like, like really a construct, right? Uh, like IDPA stuff that's more closely associated <clears throat> with what's likely to happen – uh, and, and isn't outlandish or uh, crazy. It's not like, you know, a shootout in Baghdad or anything like that, but it's it, it's reasonable. And, you know, or there's a historical example from the news. Mm -hmm. um, that's very good in order to produce internal stress. In other words, if the three of us are watching Brandon shoot, he's aware of us watching him. Mm -hmm. We're not going to stop watching him. And when the buzzer, when the timer goes... He has to perform. Right. He can't get away from that stress, right? Which means adrenalization, which means he's forcing himself to perform in a stressful circumstance. There's there's absolutely no better training than consequential training, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's shooting or whether it's combatives. I mean, you you so so people who impugn competitive shooting, guess what? They normally don't, do they? <laughs> right, right.
Right. Absolutely. And again, nobody's shooting back at you, obviously, you know, so, but, but the, the thing is, again, you know, having done a lot of both, I can tell you my heart rate gets more elevated at a competition match than in force on force training. Mm -hmm. There is a significant, um, adrenaline dump that happens with that you know it's just the whole aspect of competing being competitive in front of your peers watching and all of that and and, unless people have done that they don't realize so you know that's that's the shooting equivalent of just putting yourself out there and getting Mm -hmm. uncomfortable and and being able to think with a gun in your hand and i would offer that you know if if you're if you're not doing consistently some kind of martial art, then I think courses like yours are the best thing people can do. And even if you are, I still think it's the best thing people can do because I would think, speak to this, Kelly, if you get a guy who's, you know, been doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu for years, what's he going to get though coming to you that's beyond what he's been used to, you know, doing the typical dojo uh, jiu-jitsu thing? Great question. Um, So, Anytime anyone says like that, like like questions like that to me, what I'll ask them is true or false, uh, black belt jujitsuans have been knocked out with punches to the head. True or false? True, 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 absolutely. Okay. True or false, very accomplished guys with their hands in Muay Thai and boxing have been choked out. True or false? True. Right? So again, you can learn, no ma- even if you've mastered something, like you master BJJ, like your whole game plan is thinking like, okay, I'm going to get this to the ground. Let's pull that thread a little bit. Years ago, there was a study that said that 90% of all fights end up on the ground. You remember, we all remember that statistic, mm-hmm. right? I'm, Luke, I'm sure you remember it because you rolled. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where that came from was LAPD. LAPD st- was working with the Gracies and they said like, yeah, you know, 90% of the time we end up on the ground. Now, why would that be true with police? Because they have a responsibility to handcuff them. Right. So they're trying to get them to the ground. So they're going to get them on the ground. Restraints. Right. Okay. But in actuality, (laughs) that's not a, there's, there's no way to, to do that factually, right? It's always going to be anecdotal information, right? Because there's no way to pull people who have had fights on the street and come up to an actual number that says like, you know, 65% 65% of all street fights go on the ground because mm-hmm. I don't believe that's true. A lot of people get knocked out, man. A lot of people get knocked out. A lot of people get hurt and quit, yeah. you know? So, so I mean, I, the, the answer to the question is we all have something to learn from someone, right? Every time I run a class, I learn something from a student. I'll see a student move a particular way or do something. And sometimes enough to make me say, do that again. And they'll try to adjust because they think I, saw something they did wrong. And I say, no, 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 exactly like you just <laughs> did it. Right. And then, and you go, huh. Right. Never saw that before. There's that's from a guy that doesn't know how to do anything, but that actually worked. Right. And then we pressure test it over and over and over again. So, so uh, if a guy has like a BJJ black belt or anything like that, that d- d- doesn't preclude them at all from coming and learning a whole new skill set. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot of yeah. guys that do BJJ, don't forget, they do IBJJF stuff. And it has nothing to do with actual fighting. It has nothing to do with MMA. It has nothing to do with, like, the minute that you start punching them in the head, they they fold up. They they just don't want to deal with it because they don't. They're 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 observing BJJ protocols, right? Like uh, slap tap. You know, Luke, what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And then I'm not going to get heavy elbows in your abdomen. I'm not going to cross face you. I'm not going to you know put my hand over your mouth. I'm not going to punch you. We're just going to chain roll. Okay, so. So guys that want to do jujitsu like that, they're kind of insulted when they go to an MMA gym. You know, they're mm-hmm. like, hey, you know, I don't, I don't know if I'm OK with that. So you can always take your your background, no matter how good you are or whatever. And I think learn from a different perspective or a different approach uh, to the problem. For sure. Yeah, I remember Greg quite a few times like we'll be rolling and now you can tap each other like slaps. That completely changes everything because you're not mm-hmm. you're, I'm on the ground or whatever and I'm not trying to look for a punch to the face because we're just rolling doing BJJ. But then when you start he's slapping me in the face, I'm like, well, shit, I gotta control this and control like which I, means I, your I, arms I, are now extended. Right. And then so my arms there and then my arms out. So like and that's not what we do day in, day out, right? You know, so that'd be great to get more of that, you know. 
um, imagine if I'm in side control, right? And uh, you can handle it, right? You're looking to get a knee shield in or go quarter hip mm -hmm. or whatever. But instead, I palm heel your face, cross face you, and I keep you from looking at me. <laughs> right. right? So that's a whole that's a whole different problem because right. your, head, your head's facing this way. Now my elbow's in your cheek socket, and I've got pressure on that. It changes mm -hmm. everything, right? right? So we can all learn from each other by by Sal's perspective, Brandon's perspective, Luke's perspective, my perspective. It's just uh, you know, it's got to be kind of that mutually supporting thing where we all understand that we have value when we show up for training, you know? right? Yeah. And I think one of the awesome things uh, that you mentioned, you know, numerous times throughout the class was how valuable you and, and you take from all those different disciplines, um, because since you're known as a combatives guy, you talked about some of the derp and ridiculous crap that's come into combatives. Right. So I wasn't quite I, I didn't anticipate that from you just because I've read so much of the stuff that you've written or what other people have written about you. But I, I was I was expecting at least some of it, but I didn't get any of that at all. So, you you know, you praise jujitsu and boxing and and uh, mixed martial arts and all of this and wrestling. And, and you make the point that even if those systems are not a complete system for the street, guys who are doing it all the time, th this idea that, and you've touched on this numerous times now, that guys with, oh, I do combative, so I just gouge his eyes or whatever. The idea that you can go up against a guy who is three days a week is going and yep. fighting other resisting human beings is so absurd. And, yes, and that alone is is value. Taking a class like the classes that you offer is is that discussion. is is just man, you, You've got to experience it. And I can admit, uh, you know, myself, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go out and join a jujitsu gym. I admit right. that, you know, kudos to you, Luke, you, you do that, you know, but I think, uh, I think the experience though, of going and getting smacked around in a class like this now. Yeah. I know some good techniques and all of that. And, you know, I'll practice that shit on, on the bag at home and whatever, Bob. but Yeah. But if, if nothing else, on Bob, yeah, uh, my Bob bag has made numerous appearances on this show, Kelly. It's always yeah. a big for whatever reason. But yeah, on the Bob bag. But no, the, the reality is, you know, doing training like this, not only will you walk away knowing some good shit, you'll know better what you can do. And you'll know better. You don't want any part of this shit. Yep. You know, for, for myself, I can tell you that I don't want to throw down with a guy like that. Right. So if, 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 you know, if, if, if OC spray can short circuit it before it goes to hands, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and just your avoidance of things. And, you know, I'd, I'd be willing to, you know, uh, eat humble pie and apologize to a guy, even if I feel like kicking his ass so mm -hmm. that I can leave the parking lot without getting into it. And that alone is worth the price of admission, just getting a better understanding of, of what it's like. And, you know, do you, do you really want to do that? on the street where guys have weapons on them and you have your own weapon on you, you know, it's, yeah. it's just absurd. Importantly, Sal, one point I want to make out of what you just said is you said it's important to go to a course like that and get smacked around. But Im importantly, you smacked some people around too. So, so it's, you know, you got a chance to throw your hands right. and actually yeah. hit people in the face, you know, and, 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 and it reminds you, Oh yeah. I mean, I can do that. I can mm -hmm. do that. You know, so so it's kind of like that thing where it's like it. I, I understand why you were saying it that way, but but I also wanted the viewers to understand that like th there's benefit to going. Hey, you know, I tagged that guy, yeah. I got mine in, right? That yep. that's important too. Mm -hmm. And speaking of which, there was one part in the course where Kelly actually had us take some hits, like some hits to the neck and stuff. And mind you, you know, we're doing this on each other at one tenth our real power. And it still rattles your cage. And and what that did was you realize that, you know, if I had to put a guy down hard, I know that what that feels like at one-tenth the power I could actually put into that, yep. what you'd be able to do. So I thought that was awesome how you actually had us do that. Like yeah, uh, some strikes to the side of the neck and the back of the neck and that kind of thing. And you realize, hey, you know what? If I was in a situation where I had to hit this guy hard, maybe preemptively, whatever, now I have an understanding of what that would actually do because mm -hmm. it rattled my cage mm -hmm. and the guy was hitting me at one-tenth his power, you know? Right now. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's hard to, I, I, we've, we've suffered, not suffered, but you know, when, when you're doing a feel good course, when we're all going to sing Kumbaya and we're going to hit pads and, you know, do that bullshit, uh, your courses are huge, right? Like people come and they're like, no one's going to get hurt. Um, I'm not going to be put in awkward or uncomfortable positions and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Our courses are not that. I mean, our courses are intense and there's going to be fighting and all that stuff. And the class numbers shrink, you know, I mean, because people are not, they say they want to do self-defense, but then when it comes right down to it, they want to play self-defense, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's like we always say in boxing, right? You don't play boxing, man. You know, you can't. Um, mm -hmm. So we do it as safely as possible, right? Uh, there's a lot of supervision. Everybody's getting a lot of good corrective action. So you don't have to do so many reps. I mean, before you get it right, you know, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. We follow it with great camaraderie, right? We hang around, we drink a few beers. And, uh, you know, we it's self-vetting. That's good. We never have uh, idiots come to courses because I, I think our reputation precedes us. And anyone that's who's like going to be a loud mouth or something, they know what the end of that what's going to happen. I mean, when you're in a gym with a bunch of MMA fighters, you know what's going to happen, you know, so they just stay away and we end up with a really good uh, showing for all of our courses. Now, uh, smaller than some of the courses that are out there where you'll see like 50 people go into a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a you know, a, a no touch knockout course. Like what even is that? What the hell is I that? was about to ask you what that, what is that? <laughs> yeah, man. Like, but you'll get like 35 people paying money to go to a no touch knockout course when there's no such thing. It's absolute bullshit. I'm but you know why they go that. is because yeah. they want an answer that is risk free. In other words, I don't have yeah. to risk being hit. Um, you know, I'm just going to know this way that I can send my energy and someone's going to get knocked out. And dude, they, you, they'll get 35, 40 people at those. And I mean, like, they're all like nerdly guys and shit like that. But at the end of the day, it's, it's like absolute ridiculous nonsense. You know, you come to an average course with us, it's going to be, you know, 12 to as many as 22, 25 people, usually right in there. Um, but okay. You know, everyone's everyone's going to be real. <laughs> you saw, man. Yeah. I mean, it's going to it's going to be a real thing, you know. Yeah, no, I I can't recommend it highly enough. I mean, and and again, I'm not a combatives guy. I, I've I've done a few seminars with hand to hand stuff. I've been you know avid shooter for a long time, but along the way, I realized, hey, you got to have some hand skills, you know. So I've done a little bit of it. This was by far the most intense hand to hand training I had done, and it was freaking awesome. You know, so for those of you who are thinking, man, I don't feel like getting beat around, you know, I didn't, you're going to leave. And even if you leave with a few bruises, you're going to leave with a smile on your face saying right. that was the most awesome thing I've done in years. <laughs> it was amazing, you know, and, and it's true. I mean, and, you know, nothing 800 milligrams of ibuprofen can't handle after the <laughs> fact. Or if you're like me, that, you know, a few uh, shots of bourbon when you get home or even right at Kelly's place, Kelly opens up the bar after class. And this is serious. He does. And he's serving everybody whatever drinks they're asking. You know, I I drank Guinness, mainly Kelly, because I thought that was appropriate, you know, in, in yep. the facility. So, you know, uh, so it, it's just a phenomenal experience. It, it really is. And, and I think a lot of people um, won't do classes like this. The other one that comes to mind is uh, something like ECQC that Craig yep. Doug Douglas teaches, you know, because they're hard physical classes. Uh, people will shy away from it, but the experience is consistently everybody who's done it. I've never talked to one person who regretted doing it. Right. I've not talked to one right. person who's done one of your classes and regretted it or done something like ECQC. All you hear is rave reviews like this was phenomenal. This changed my whole outlook on the way I. You just got to get out and do it and you'll love doing it and walk away with uh, an enhanced skill set. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly, afterwards, Sal would not shut up about your course <laughs> that he took. Oh, thank he you, just, Brandon. He just yeah, kept yeah, going no, and going and going. Absolutely. And I, I, uh, I appreciate that. On the show, before the show, after the show. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It was, uh, so we, we knew well, he had well, a good well, time. Again, so a lot of people in our audience are probably familiar with Kelly McCann, right? Because if you were into guns or martial arts back in – Kelly, when did the Paladin Press stuff come out? The the inside think, the Crucible stuff. 
I think we started doing, uh, I had like 30 titles with Paladin Press, and I think we started in like 93. Okay, so I'm not mistaken, because I feel like it was when I was a teenager. I was seeing mm -hmm. that stuff, so I was. Uh, so, you know, I, I reading old magazines like uh, Combat and Survival magazine and all this crap. You know, I'm a gun guy since the time I was a kid, so I was reading that crap. You'd see the advertisements for it in there. And then you'd go to the store and on Black Belt magazine, you know, Kelly McCann is on the cover. He's always got a great article about something that's more realistic than just, you know, traditional dojo martial arts. So I, kind of, I grew up with that. And then there were the DVDs and all of that. So for me, I was very excited to come down and actually train with you for the first time in person. You know, because it was it, for anybody my age, which sadly is now certainly middle age, you know, um, it, we, we grew up with that and, and knowing you in both the gun world and the martial arts world. And, and that's also one of the cool things about your background is how you straddle both worlds so well. So for me, it was a big deal, you know, training. Uh, with thanks, you. man. I, I appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah, you know, childhood hero. What can I say? You know, so, so, but, but we'll definitely have to have you back on, certainly, and and get into the gun oh, absolutely. stuff too, because uh, you know, I I know you have a long background in in gun writing. You know, you you were innovative in a lot of early gun stuff and all of that. But I'm glad we hit on the combatives pretty hard tonight. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, everybody, Brandon, Luke, Sal, thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for being on. It was awesome. Yeah, and and Will, you know, anytime you want to come on, if uh, you know Sal can organize it, um, we, we just we have this was such a great conversation, and we you know the the hour goes by so quickly, and we only just scratched the surface. So. Um, you know, if and you want to come on, go, we, we went eight minutes over. And usually by this point, Brandon is yelling at us and telling us we have to <laughs> <laughs> gonna ask you an hour. But no, we'll, we'll plan. If, if you're game to come back on, uh, you know, we, we can go topic specific on different topics uh, again, you know, for yeah. our audience. Kelly's well known with the combative stuff, but, you know, you did a lot of gun writing back in the day and you did sure. really innovative stuff with the contact distance gunfighting stuff you know so i'd i'd love to have you back on to talk about some of that stuff i would absolutely love it guys awesome awesome well kelly don't go anywhere stick around while we uh after we end this but um so we are we're still sticking to the two-week schedule so we're gonna be back we're doing that right luke yeah, and I can't click on anything on my computer, so I can't. Yeah, tell Luke, you. Luke's been locked out for the last. My computer's been locked minutes. up. But the feed's fine, so I haven't touched anything. Yet. Yeah, so <laughs> we'll be back um, two weeks from tonight, so February eighth at ten p.m. Eastern, and uh, and then we'll announce the giveaway winner, and then yeah. in 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 twelve to eighteen months, you'll receive your stuff, and then we'll, <laughs> exactly. we'll get a new winner. Exactly. So. <laughs> I send out stuff once a year, so keep. Uh, Keep asking questions. I, I really think... send it. Hey, listen, I, I'm a co-host, and it took a year for me to get my U.S. <laughs> carry and concealed nation hat, but I did get it. It took a year, but I got it. So those no, of and, you and, and promise just, the giveaway. And it just is to be up. clear, just to be clear, you were waiting for U.S.A. carry hat and a concealed nation hat. They were both late, but they were both sent by Luke. I realized he had the concealed nation hat. True. Yeah, I'm, 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 the, know. I'm the shipper, so whatever. Well, listen, the, the, I, I did get it. It took a year, but I got it. Okay, so those of you who have been promised stuff in the audience, it will show up eventually. It See, will. so nobody has anything to complain about. See, Troy's still waiting on his. I think he emailed me earlier today. It's coming. I'll get oh, to it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right. Kelly McCann, well, thank, cool. you, yeah. thank you and so we'll much. Thanks, back, guys. Right? We'll, we'll have Kelly back for sure, and we'll, sure. we'll have another great discussion at some point. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we will see you guys again uh, February 8th. Take care. Cool. Thanks for joining us. Cheers, guys.